So Jeremy show with us how to make money creating iOS apps. So this session is for all of you that just want to create an iOS app, maybe just as a companion app for your web or desktop apps, or just a new iOS app from scratch, just to submit it to the App Store and start to to receive money from users. Uh, it's kind of quite a star guide for those of you that just have web or desktop background development. So as you know, both web and desktop are have their own features and intrinsicities, and it's the same thing with iOS. So Let's view how, how to go through all of this, starting with the setup. That is the most important thing. Of course, if you are going to develop for iOS devices, you are going to need a Mac computer with MacOS, starting 10, 14, and also Xcode from 11 to the most current version. Probably you will want to have the most current, current version of Xcode and also on MacOS and have them on sync. Of course, you can have several Xcode versions installed at the same time, but in that case, what is important is to ma make sure that the command line tools are the ones for the latest version. Not just because Xcode itself, but also because Soyo is going to need those to make some processes when debugging the app or compiling the app for distribution. <coughs> and speaking about the simulator, uh, if your Mac is based on an Intel processor, you will be able to run the simulator starting with iOS 11. But if your Mac is based on M1 processor, then uh, the minimum version of the iOS you are going to run in the simulator is 14.2. So the most common thing during the development process is just to run your app using the simulator on different, uh, several devices, iPhone, iPad, several versions of the operating system on both kind of de devices. This is something that is integrated in the IDE itself. Just choose the device you want to use with the version of the iOS you want to use, and that works. But if you install Xcode for first time, it will install the default, by default, set of simulators on your computer, and that is what you are going to be able to select from the IDE. So, if you want to add or delete simulators that are shown under the debug uh, menu on the IDE, you are going to use Xcode and then simulators. And in the left corner, there is a plus sign you can click on to access to the windows that allows you to add new simul simulators to it by default for the current SDK version installed in your Mac, but you also can download previous SDKs in order to create simulators based on that previous iOS versions. So how it works? Really easy. There is, for example, let's select a project here. I don't know why. Um, this one, for example, we have project run on, on, and here we can see the set of IO simulators that are installed by default with the latest Xcode release. So, iPhone 14 Pro Max, 16.4, and it works. Of course, as you may expect, you can set breakpoints in your code, and when it reaches the breakpoint, just jump over the IDE to review the variables, objects, continue, etc. 
And as I said, if you go to Xcode, let's make this bigger, there is the devices and simulator window. When you choose this option in the menu, you can click on the plus in order to add new simulators to it. By default, the, in this case, the SDK that is installed in this computer is 14.2, so if you want to install simulators for previous versions of the iOS, you select download additional SDKs, clicking on the plus button, selecting iOS, and then you will be able to select another one. As for example, 16.2. Ah. I don't have internet connection at this moment, but this is the all the process. Once you download the simulator, you go back to the ID and then project run on refresh and it will update to reflect the new simulator that has been added using Xcode. But of course, what is recommended is not just to use the simulator during, during the development process. That's because the simulator can't be able to get all the hardware features you can use in a real device, but also because it's recommended before you deploy the app to, through the App Store or to, through the enterprise program just to check how your app behaves on real devices, including iPhones, but also iPads. So for that, you have to enroll the Apple, the Apple developer program. As you know, there are several options. You can do it for free using just your Apple ID, but I recommend to go with a paid option that brings more options to you in order to use all the features from the iOS SDK, also from, from Soyo. And of course, you also need to register the, dev the device you want to use for testing with your team. In this case, the team is the Apple Developer Program account you created. Uh, through the examples, I'm using my personal Apple Developer account for that. Through the years, Apple has simplified a lot this process in Xcode itself. So now you only have to connect the device in Xcode and it takes care of everything, adding the device to your account and that's done. About why to pay for the developer program? Well, you can see here a table when you enroll the Apple Developer Program, paying for it, you have a lot of features you can use and test on real devices. While using the free account, it is quite more limited. For example, things like, I don't know, data protection, notifications, call kit, background modes, well, this one is covered, and also Apple Pay, among others. What's the one in the middle? Oh, the, the one in, in the middle is because this is Apple Developer Program, Apple Developer Enterprise Program, and then the free one. And of course, in order to run 
your apps from Soyo on the device, you have to make sure that is enabled the developer mode switch in your own device. So from the Soyo point of view, when you want to run on device, you have to make sure that you select the app object and then select the team and then for development in this, in this case. If you are going to build the app for deployment through the app store that needs to be done using the transporter app from Apple, then you will choose uh, distribution instead of development. So how it works? Well, let's try. I have my magical cable connecting it to the device. Make sure that it is unlocked. And in this same project that we ran on the simulator, as you know, it is detecting new device connected something that is done automatically. So now I select the iOS object in the navigator. I select my team, that is my account as developer, wait for development, and if now I go through project, run on, me, my device is listed right on the top. So selecting it starts to compile, sends the app to the device, and the first time this process is done, I'm going to see my app right here. For those of you that are in the last row, let's try something. Oh. Hello. This. So I'm using the device and I can do everything here and as in the simulator itself, if I set a breakpoint in my code and it reach that breakpoint, it will jump back to the IDE so I can step in watching the variables, objects, etc., and play to continue using the app on the device itself. You can have as many devices connected to your Mac as you need or want to. All of them will appear under the menu. Let's exit the app so the debugger session is ended will appear on the run on device on the Soyo ID. And this is related what we seen when, when talking about why to enroll paying for the Apple developer account instead of using the free one. The entitlements and capabilities, these are features that require some special switches or activations that are embedded in the info list file when the app is created. Some of them also require to be enabled in the profile for the app. That is something speaking about Apple IDs, profiles, certificates, etc. will require a session, a different session on itself. So entitlements is something you can find, again, under the iOS object in the inspector panel, selecting the settings. And here you can enable the requisite requ requ entitlement, for example, for Apple Pay, access to the camera on the device if your app needs to use it, uh, maps, locations, etc. 
So if you plan to create an iOS app using this kind of features, you have to enable them here. And in some cases, not just here, but also when creating the profile for the app itself. So how is the iOS app structure? It's not much different from what we know already from the macOS apps. In this case, when you install the app in the simulator or the device, or when it is distributed in, from the App Store, it creates what is called a sandbox environment. That means that this kind of creating the folders, the structure or hierarchy that you will find in the system itself. That includes documents folder, that is where you can put the documents created by your app. Of course, you can access this folder from your iOS code, calling a special folder documents. Also, application support that we know already from Windows, uh, MacOS, and that is where you should put some files like preferences or mm, SQLite databases, kind of that additional files that are not created by, by the user of your app. Then, of course, the temporary folder that should be used only for temporary files. Why? Because the iOS system can delete them at any moment it requires to do it. And the caches folder that is mostly used by the iOS itself, and for example, for things like creating proxies from the screens of your app user interface. About the app life cycle, it differs a bit compared with, with, with the, the app life cycle on desktop or web. For example, when the user tap on the app icon on the device, it is opened and then activated and enters the usual event loop. But as a, iPhone or iPad users, we are used to change between applications. And at that point, the app changes from activated to deactivated. But still, in deactivated mo mode, it can continue executing some special events in the event loops if, in the case, it receives some special kind of data. Even when the app is in deactivate mode, it can be terminated without the user requiring it, just because the iOS needs some resources and then get rid of your app. Or in a normal use, is the user who decides to close the app. So there are two special events that probably you, you will want to implement depending on the kind of application you consider to, to do for iOS. The first one is low memory warning. That is the one that is going to get fired when the uh, device requires memory or your app is consuming too much memory. And this is where you have the time just to save the most important things for the logic or you app because it can be terminated at any moment without much, much time to do many things. And significant time change because, well, you know, well, you are here, most of you traveling from different places of the world with several time zones. And this is the one that is fired when the device detects that there is a significant time change. So if you are developing some kind of app that needs to fire notifications based on day and time, probably you will want to get notified of that changes. 
So second thing, where do you should put the resources for the app? Well, it depends. And depends si those resources are going to be used only for the app or also are going to be modified by the user. And that means also the databases. Because even if the user just is going to query the database, that also modifies the database. So in this case, the user is better to, to put this kind of resources using a copy to build a step and moving it to, well, the resource folder. And then when in the opening event of the app, we need to make sure that we are moving that resource from the resource app in the bundle of the app to the documents folder in, Node, in the sandbox environment that is created when the app is installed in the device or the simulator. So for example, in this same app, we can see here the copy DB that is pointing to a folder on my, on my hard drive is applied both to debugging and deployment and as destination, the parent folder, but it should be resource folder. So if we inspect the opening event in the app object, we can see how the first thing we do is moving that file from the resources folder to the documents folder in case it has not been done before. So speaking about databases, by default, and this is important because um, iOS, the development on Soyo only supports SQLite databases, as Apple does. If you go to Xcode and want to work with a database, the only one supported is SQLite deployed with the app itself. But most of the cases, you are going to want to talk not with local databases, but with remote ones. And in that case, how you can do that? Well, you can do it using a REST API, as Ricardo told us yesterday. You can use a web app just for do this. Or if you use, for example, a Postgres-based database, you can install this service that is an interme intermediate layer creating the REST API for you. Anyway, the iOS app is going to use the API. The API going to be talking with the database, retrieving the data, and send back to your mobile device. Well, and what about the layout? On web, we have web pages. On desktop, we have uh, Windows. So on iOS, we have screens. And everything starts with the app object, as it is the case for web and also for desktop apps. And here in the inspector panel, we can set the by default layout for iPhone and the by default layout when the app is executed on iPad. In this skeleton that is created every time you select create new iOS project, you see that you get two layouts by default. One is for iPhone, while another one is for iPad. Is when selecting for, for example, in this case, the layout for iPhone, when you select once again in the Spectre panel, the by default screen for that layout. And here you can set some switches in order to tell the app if you want to support portrait mode, landscape mode, rotated to the left, to the right, etc. And finally, we 
arrive to the screen itself that is, is where the layout is done. As always, dragging controls from the library directly to the screen. But in this case, while on web and desktop, we can control the position of the controls using the locks. On iOS is quite different. In this case, we are going to need to use constraints. Most of the times when doing the layout of your iOS screens, this works pretty well, but in some, some other cases, you are going to need to do some minor adjustments. For example, instead of looking to top, left, right, bottom, in this case, you are going to need to set that parameters yourself using constraints that are relative between the controls you set. So how it works? Well, in this case, once again, we can see, for example, selecting this one, we have several controls here. If I select the canvas, we have the auto layout in the specter panel and it is setting the eight, the right, that is attached to the parent, right side, the top, to the top layout guide, and the width with an absolute value. In this case, the address label, you have to put the same kind of parameters. If you want to edit any of these, just click on edit and then enter the required values so they can adjust when, when you rotate the device or in portrait mode, mode. Of course, there are many options to add to the auto layout and also it is possible to work with this kind of constraints at runtime for any graphical object in the screens of your iOS apps. And what about app navigation? Well, on iPhone, iPad, we have a quite a small screen compared with the display for a regular desktop app. So usually we have to options to change the screen that is showed at a given moment. One of these is accessing the content property to, from the current layout property of the app object and setting it to a new screen. The content property is an iOS layout content data type. So what is an iOS layout content property? Well, it can accept screen objects, iOS tab bar objects, or for just for iPad, iOS split view objects. What led us to set the screen or view for the left and the right sides. But this is just only supported for iPad, not for iPhones. And that drive us to the stack-based navigation that is the most typical paradigm used when developing for iOS devices. In this paradigm that is the most you are used to, to use even for, from the apps of the iPhone itself when accessing settings or whatever, you select the first screen and when you tap on any of the options, you are presented with a new view or a screen that sits on top of the first one. If the second view offers some option that you tap and brings to a new one screen, that one will sit on, the, on top of that one, creating what is known as the stack-based navigation. Of course, by default, and this is also what is supported by Soyo, you can go back in the stack, pushing the button in the upper bar, the navigation bar. 
The second option is based on tab bar based navigation. You create a tab bar as you do right now on desktop or web and assign to each button and a screen that can bring the stack based navigator. So you can combine both kind of types. In this code, we are creating a new iOS tab bar instance, setting the icon that is going to be used, and adding to it the customers that is the screen that is going to be shown when the user tap uh, push or tap on that button. But there are some special features on iOS devices, as for example, the app Shortcuts. This is kind of the same menu you can find when you create it for the icon in the dock. So if you create shortcuts for your apps and the app is selected in the home screen doing a long touch, the menu is displayed, as you can see here, and allows present a series of options that when selected fires an event in, all, in our app that we can catch to do any action we want to do. How to create this kind of shortcuts? We can do that from code, but also once again through the capabilities options in the inspector panel in a more visual or intuitive way. So when enabling, enabling the shortcuts, we can enter the type, the title for the, that shortcut, the subtitle, and the icon we want to use. We can use also notifications, and they can be local notifications or remote notifications that can be handled using your own server, what requires a lot of knowledge, or using Soyo Cloud, what is simply clicking a couple of buttons and simplifies the, the process a lot. In both cases, you are going to need to use the notification center object. And we can see how it works right here. In this case, notifications. In this project, we have added a notification center object that has several events. Authentication, succeeded, error, received, or sent. So when we run the project, We need to request the authentication, send the authentication, in this case it's local to the device itself, and the notification is shown on a screen. There are also specific classics to handle user authentication through face ID and touch ID. What means that in modern devices, you are going to probably want to use these classes to authenticate any operation you require to do using these technologies from Apple. We can emulate this once again in the simulator in this case, we have added the object to the project with the two events. One, when the authentication has to sit, and if there is some kind of error. As you can see here, in this case, accessing the inspector for this object, capabilities, we have enabled user authentication capability for this to work. 
and when it's run on the simulator, it also requires to enable the enrolled option under the face ED, under the features menu on the simulator. If you don't this, it won't work. So in this case, the simulator tries to emulate face ID authentication, clicking on it, oh, error. So these are the kind of things it's better to try on a real device. Um, probably one of the major changes when you change from developing for web or desktop are the list box that are converted into tables on the, on the IOS field. What are one of the main constraints in, in this sense? On the tables, you only can handle one column you have sections, what is good. You can use the table as you are used to use the, uh, list boxes on desktop with a row, but what is recommended is to use the data source interface as you probably do on web apps. That way, your app implements a series of methods that are going to be called to return the number of sessions, the number of rows, and every time the data for a row is required. One important thing that is a very, very good thing is that you will be able to use custom, customizable table cells. What this means is kind of a container you can design with your own controls, being that custom, custom, customized cell what is going to be used for every row of the, of the table. Other thing that is really nice is having actions attached on every row of your table. Currently, if you drag a row of, the, of a table from right to left, you can have several actions attached to it, as for example, when using the mail app or many, many others to delete to verify or add, whatever. And in a further version of Sojo, you will be able not only to attach these actions when drag, dragging a row from right to left, but also when dragging from left to right. Of course, you can set in the preferences options to allow refreshing the data on the table what is really nice when you are using a data source and also for our search. When, enab when enabling the option for our search doesn't mean that it's going to do the search for you. You are going to implement the code, the logic to do the search among the data you provide, but in, in this case, that method is going to be called. So here, we can see how it is implemented in this case. In the customer screen, we choose interfaces and we can see how the iOS mobile table data source is enabled. So once it's enabled, it adds a series of methods implemented but that class interface that are required in order to set the number of rows to get or retrieve the data for a specific row, the count of sessions for that table and the section title. So we get Cool. Uh -huh. 
So this is the, the result. This is not using add row on the table, but using the data source paradigm. Another one that is important is fonts handling on iOS. On desktop, for example, where we are used to set the name of the font, just Helvetica, Times, wherever, simple, and change its size, color, style, directly, even at wrong time, at any point for the same font. On iOS, doesn't work that way. It uses the PostScript name of the font, is class instance based, what means that one, once you create a new instance for the font, you can't change any value for that particular instance. That means you can change the size, you can change the style, or wherever. You need to create a new instance for the font and also has specific properties over those phone on desktop or web, where probably you are using the style property. So what are the names of the fonts you need to use instead? Well, we have here an example project. Let's make it bigger. Let's run it on the simulator. And these are the fonts, the PostScript name of the fonts you are going to use every time you need to create an instance. So for example, if you want to use American typewriter, you create an instance for American typewriter. But if suddenly you need to use that same font with bold style, you need to create a new instance using this name, American Type Writer dash bold. As you can see here in this example project, it is possible to change the size of the font. We put here 50, set the font, it's bigger, but what happens behind the scenes, if we review the code, is that it's creating a new font instance. It's not changing a parameter for the font itself, it's creating a new instance. Uh, it is how it works. So how do you or can you extend the iOS framework? Uh, the iOS framework, as you can see through the documentation and the multiple examples provided to you or the blog posts or the videos on our YouTube channel, is quite extensive and we are improving it during the last cycles. Uh, of course, we'll continue to improve it. As for example, and Travis mentioned it on one of the sessions, changing the layout based on constraints to locks as you are used to use on desktop and web. So in order to extend in the iOS features, you can use declares, uh, it's possible today with desktop. Of course, open source projects and also plugins from third parties. Some um, of these open source projects are the listed here that also you can get through the documentation website. Uh, most of them what are using behind the scenes are declares, but it makes your life much easier. So I recommend to use this, this when you find something that is not yet implemented on the iOS framework and then provide a functionality for that or third parties plugins. So that's all. Questions? Yeah. When you, let's say you connect to a remote database with a, with a web service. Mm -hmm. 
the address where you want to go, you have to put, is it going to go in the document folder? Is it going to go in the special? Oh, no, it's, it's yeah. in code or in resources if you want to keep that address some, somewhere. Somewhere, so the user won't see it. Oh, no. There is a way you, you can, uh, let's see you are developing an app and you need to inspect the contents of the files created for the user itself. And there is a way to do that from Xcode. So, for example, when me, with my device attached here, I can access the apps that are installed on the device, mm -hmm. and then I can select download container. So I download the container to my desktop, and this is internally a bundle field show contents of the bundle. And here is the folders structure we talked about in our first slides. So I can go to the documents folder, inspect what has been created, the same for the library that is kind of application support, the catches folder where the iOS puts some data. Okay, so you better put your web address for your web service in the code. In the code, yeah. But then it won't be seen. But in any case, remember that all the stuff you are going to put in your app once it is deployed is de deployed in a sandbox set environment. So it should not be no. accessed by okay. users, but it should not. Our question? Yep. I prefer to, to put them selecting resources folder so you can access them then using special folder, resource, the name of the file, and so you that take care of that. But put in on resources. In the, in the copy, have, copy build. I have my app and I have my database in the empty form under the structure, it means not selected. So now I install the app. Mm -hmm. Well, the question is once you deploy the app with the database in the resources folder, for example, and that app gets installed in the user device, when the user opens your app, you are responsible of moving that database file from, the, from resources to documents that is in the user device. And then... No. Oh, you can put there too, yeah. Documents is just for documents created from the user. If the device is backup, if the uh, application support directory is backup also? Nope. No? This was my question. Oh, but anyway, next time the user opens the app, it is going to be copied from the app bundle. Data in there, so oh, yeah. I think he's meaning more about iCloud. Oh, that's okay. I that's okay. So if, if I have an iPhone, I have an app, and I put some, some data in there, where, where does it reside? In the application support directory or in the document directory? If you copy the database to the documents directory, it is going to be in the documents directory. I don't want the user to see my data, but 
Oh, but the, 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 the user is not going to, to swim. So, yep. Actually, it's uh, not the only thing. Obviously, with a, if you're running a Mac with an error on the processor, you can run the BIOS app on your desktop. Huh. And you can just look at that and see just how much, because you can still go and open and close the, open the folder and have a look through and then share them with the users. So, what, you know, if, if you've got in mind that, Uh, based on what I show it here, not. Because uh, this is for development, not for deployment. It's not sign it, it's not sandbox it, you know, so it's not the same thing.